We've spent the last three, week, three weeks on the subject of prayer, and we began by emphasizing that prayer is a means of fellowship with God. Then we also considered a model prayer that Jesus gave his disciples, and by extension, us as well. And last week, Pastor Jim did a, an excellent job in challenging us as a church, as the body of Christ, to be a house of prayer. And one of that characteristics of being a house of prayer is that we pray for one another. Pastor Jim pointed out that when we ask someone, is there anything I can pray for you? The response is often, no, I'm okay. As if that question was meant to unmask some great need or dark secret, especially if the pastors are asking. I, I told him I really wanted to give a testimony I was going to interrupt him at that point, but decided not to. But I thought I would mention the, the impact of that statement. Uh, back at the end of September, I took a personal one-day prayer retreat at one of the areas of the Patapsco State Park. It was wonderful because I was alone, there was few distractions, and I was able to spend the day praying and reading scripture. Uh, and I had two objectives. I wanted to hear from the Lord on some specific direction in my life to, to get some answers and hopefully gain some wisdom. I hoped to have walked away from that time of prayer with a more concrete knowledge of his will. But I didn't. So I'm still praying and I'm still waiting. But what I was reminded of is that we walk by faith and not by sight. My other objective, my second objective, was to pray for you, for all of you. And so I took a copy of our church directory, and I prayed for every person in our church directory, as well as other people in my life. And I can assure you that I asked God's blessing on you and your family. But what was humbling, revealing, and personally convicting was that for some people for whom I prayed, that's all I knew what to pray, was for God's blessing. Because I didn't know what else to pray. Because I didn't know what the needs were. It was a humbling and convicting experience. So if there was something that I walked away with, it was the commitment to pray more precisely and more effectively. And so in order to do that, I was going to start asking the question, how can I pray for you? In fact, uh, the morning I left the state park, I came to the office, I was getting out of my car, and I saw someone that I knew who was also getting out of their car in the parking lot, and we began a, a casual conversation, and I mentioned that I had just come from a prayer retreat, and I shared with them what I just told you about wanting to pray more specifically for people, and I was going to start asking the question, is there anything that I can pray for them? The irony is even though I wanted to pray more specifically for people, and even after telling that person of my desire, I was too unaware and too dense to ask if I could pray for them. And without any prompting on my part, the person said, well, you could start with me. And while I had not expected to have a parking lot prayer meeting, I had one. And we ended with a hug. What I deeply appreciated was that person trusted me with some specific needs in their life. And for me, just that one experience not only deepened my knowledge and understanding of where they were, but it strengthened our relationship in Christ. I know this is out of context, but there is a spirit of what happened from James chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person can accomplish much. See, praying for one another is a means of edification and fellowship, but we have to be willing to trust one another at some level. And if the body is going to be strong, we have to learn how to bear one another's burdens and one of the ways we do that is to pray for one another. So, having said that, when your pastors ask you 
how can we pray for you? It's because we really want to. And better yet, you don't need to wait for us to ask. Today we're going to be thinking about the practice of prayer. Many years ago I had the opportunity to, to teach a once a week semester long evening class at a local seminary. I want to say up front that it was a great experience for me to be in that academic environment uh, and as a rookie adjunct professor and I hope that it was mutually beneficial to the students as well. The class was a Christian education of the church, a subject that was pretty far out of my comfort zone of my knowledge base. So I was grateful when the dean of students of the seminary who knew that I didn't have experience teaching at the seminary level offered to help me and he asked, would you like me to teach the first two weeks on the principles of pedagogy? I said, that would be fine especially since I had no idea what pedagogy was. <laughs> By the way, it has nothing to do with riding a bicycle. Pedagogy is the art, the science, or the profession of teaching, and it comes from a Greek word for an enslaved person who brought children to school. And so it's, it involves the theory and the practice of learning and how that process influences and is influenced by social, political, and psychological development of the learners. Now you know why I didn't know what it meant. In that first class, the dean asked this question. There were five frogs sitting on a log. Four decided to jump off. How many are left? I will readily admit that math is not a strength of mine. But I did some quick subtraction, and from what I remember, when you subtract four from five, the answer is one. So if four decide to jump off, there's one log sitting, one frog sitting on the log. He said five frogs sitting on a log, four decide to jump off, how many are left? The answer is five, because there's a big difference between deciding and doing. He went on to explain that when it comes to teaching biblical truth, whether it be a sermon, a, a Sunday school class, a small group, whatever, that, that the goal is to achieve what he called a, a uh, truth application model. It's imperative that we seek God's truth and do the best job that we can under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to rightly divide the word of truth. See, it's not about our ideas, our opinions, and our personal prejudices or preferences. I don't hope this doesn't come off sounding wrong, but one of the most fruitless times you can have in Bible study is where everybody sits around and says, well, my opinion is this, and my opinion is this. We're really not after our opinion. We're after God's opinion. We're after what the Lord wants us to learn. But truth alone is not enough if people don't know how to apply it to their lives. Without application, truth can be academic, a dry and dusty doctrine with little relevance to our daily lives. On the other hand, however, application without truth which I'm afraid I tend to hear at times, can be subjective, heretical, and dangerous. What we are after in our teaching is preaching is both truth and application, where frogs don't just decide to jump off a log, but where they actually do. So this morning, we're concluding this short series on prayer with one goal in mind, to pray to actually jump off the log and pray, which leads me to the reality that making a commitment is not the same thing as keeping a commitment. You may be familiar with this circle-shaped token that gives the owner the ability to get everything that would have needed to be done to put it off to a later date. It's called a round to it. It's been suggested that the origin of this token actually goes back to King Arthur who asked the wizard Merlin to fashion a finely crafted large round table at which King Arthur's knights 
could sit. Apparently, there was a lot of uh, infighting and division uh, among the knights, and so the idea of having a round table called a round to it uh, was a, a way that this uh, division, no one would be more important than the other because no one's sitting at the head of the table. Later, as the knights ventured further from Camelot, King Arthur had 12 gold medallions minted depicting this round table or round to it and reminding each knight of his duty to never falter. And as time passed, the medallions themselves became known as round to its to serve as a reminder to get around to it and complete it, the task at hand. Now, apparently, at the 1964 World's Fair in Queens, New York, the play on words first appeared, reinterpreting the idiom to get around to it as to get a round to it. By the way, that's probably way more information than you ever wanted to know. And before you get too excited about the possibility of owning one of these magical tokens, you should know they don't work. It's just the humorous commentary on the universal problem of human procrastination. It's not humorous, though, when it comes to our desire and commitment to pray. It's not enough to know how we should pray or want to pray or even commit to pray if we're still holding on to a round to it. The problem is not in the desire, but it's often in the discipline. So what can you and I do to help us in the discipline of prayer? Well, I think somebody who can help us here is the Old Testament prophet Daniel. Now, you're probably familiar with the story that was just read to you. This is the story where Daniel is going to be thrown into the lion's den, but do you remember what landed him there in the first place? And Daniel, not the prophet, but our Daniel, read for us this morning uh, the situation that took place. I'd like to read it a little bit again in Daniel chapter 6, beginning of verse 1. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, and they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps would be accountable to them, that is the commissioners, so that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Don't let that line miss you. He planned to appoint Daniel over the entire kingdom. Satrap is a word that means protector of the kingdom. They were representatives of the Persian ruling class and uh, were part of the nobility. Another, another word we might substitute was that they were governors, and they were appointed by the king to manage specific territories within the kingdom. They were responsible for maintaining law and order, for collecting taxes, and for providing reports to the king. And while they were primarily held a political and administrative position or responsibility, they also played a role in ensuring the observance of religious and cultural practices within their provinces, maintaining compliance with Persian custom and traditions. Now Daniel, along with two other men, were appointed as commissioners or administrators to watch over the satraps so that all the tax monies would be properly collected and none of these lesser officials could take anything from the king. Now, the Bible doesn't make it clear exactly what their specific problem with Daniel was, but it seems to grow out of Daniel's growing political authority. Whether it was fear of their losing their status, whether it was envy or perhaps even racial prejudice because Daniel was a Hebrew or something else, the satraps, along with the other commissioners, want to find a way to undermine Daniel. And so verse 4, then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to governmental affairs or government affairs. But they could not find, they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was found in him. One site suggested the satraps conspired against Daniel due to their jealousy 
and their desire to diminish his favor in the king's eyes. Recognizing Daniel's integrity and exceptional abilities, they saw him as a rival and sought to remove him from power. Daniel held a high position in the empire, which threatened their power and influence. Furthermore, the satraps wanted to eliminate any potential threat to their loyalty to the king. By conspiring against Daniel, they aimed to secure their own positions and main control over their own provinces. While we may not know exactly what their motive is, I think we can be pretty sure they were up to no good. The question has been asked, what do mythical beasts and honest politicians have in common? And the answer is, they don't exist. Asap said, we hang the petty thieves and appoint the grand ones to public office. Apparently, the questionable reputation and character of politicians has been around a long time. Another jab asks, why did the politician cross the road? Because he said he wouldn't. And when we consider some of the contemporary attitudes and stereotypes about politics, the confession of the satraps and commissioners with respect to Daniel's character is amazing. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation in regard to governmental affairs, and I love this statement, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence or corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. And when typical mudslinging tactics wouldn't work, then they concluded in verse 5, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we define it against him with regard to the law of his God. So the attack shifts from Daniel's politics to his personal faith, which implies they knew about Daniel's faith. They had either personally heard of or had witnessed Daniel's faith in God. And to put it in our context, they knew that he was a believer. I think it's important for us just to remember that Daniel, at this point in his life, is about 80 years old. He'd been taken in captive at Babylon as a youth, and now he's an old man. He has lived through several changes of political powers, different kings, and different governments, but his faith has never wavered, and his testimony has remained consistent and his witness strong. So what was it exactly that his enemies hoped to discover? Were they looking for some past moral failure, some past sin, a ghost in the closet? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want them looking in mine. What they want is to find some kind of discrepancy in Daniel's life where his profession and his practice have been inconsistent, which is why they're looking with regard to the law of God. So what do they do? What's their plan? Well, let's find out again in the beginning of verse 7. All the kingdoms of the, all the commissioners of the kingdoms, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together so that the king would establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish this injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. In verse 9, therefore King Darius signed the document, that is the injunction. In a nutshell, he signed this thing that said nobody could pray to anybody but him for 30 days. So what was Daniel's response? Verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing so previously. Then these men came by agreement and they found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. I've read this story many times, probably as you have, and it struck me Daniel could have avoided any conflict or danger by simply not praying for 30 days. 
He didn't have to pray to Darius. So why did he just not wait it out and not pray? Well, let me suggest that in part, this is because Daniel had a discipline of prayer. In other words, prayer had become a regular practice, a spiritual habit in his life. It was a routine that was ingrained in his life, not something he did occasionally or sporadically. I was curious how long it takes to develop a new habit. And one researcher suggested by some research done by the University College of London that the median amount of time necessary to build a new habit is 66 days. She goes on to say, however, it's worth noting that the study showed a wide range of timelines for any change to become a habit. Some people were able to develop a new habit in only 18 days. Others took up 254 days. Other experts believe that it's less about the time frame and how many days it takes to form a habit than the intention when it comes to building a habit. It's more about the repetition of practicing that new behavior and a determined mental outlook than a specific timeline. If you have the will, she says, to follow through, you can form that habit. That said, don't lose faith if you don't see the results you'd hoped for within a couple of weeks. I recommend that you consciously stick to your intended change and apply that mental determination for at least three to four months. By doing so, things should fall into place to create a new habit that lasts. I don't know how long it took Daniel to develop a habit, but you sort of get the impression he'd been doing this his whole life. Listen again to the Word of God. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God. And there's this last phrase, as he had been doing previously. Now there are three examples that I think that we can learn from Daniel's habit or discipline of prayer. First, he had a specific place of prayer. He entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. While a person can pray anywhere, there's something to be noted about having a specific place to meet God. Do you remember what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount? But when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Here's a different translation. But whenever you pray, go into your private stateroom, storeroom, and lock the door. King James says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. For some of us, there may not be enough room to get into our closets, much less pray. I don't think the emphasis is necessarily so much about the place as it is the privacy of the place, which is inferred by the locking of the door. We need a place that is private and undisturbed, a place that's free of interruption and distraction. And if you're thinking, I don't have a place like that in my house, then get creative. Find a place. Think outside the box. Trying to develop a habit of prayer by praying in your car while you're driving to work, however, is not going to cut it. Daniel had a specific place of prayer. Secondly, he had a specific time of prayer. He continued kneeling on his knees three times a day. When is the best time to pray? I do find it interesting that the psalmist uh, mentions the morning. Psalm 5, verse 3. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. Psalm 88, verse 13. But, O oh Lord, I've cried out to you for help, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. And in the context of praying for deliverance from his enemies, the psalmist prayed in the 55th Psalm, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will complain and murmur, and he will hear my voice. When's the best time to pray? Well, maybe it's not in the morning for you. 
So the best time to pray is the time that works for you. If the morning doesn't work, what does? The best time to pray is when you make time. In her book, A Practical Primer of Prayer, Dorothy Haskins tells the story about a noted concert violinist who was asked about her mastery over the violin. And she answered that question with two words. And I think I've shared this before, planned neglect. She said, there were many things that used to demand my time. And when I went to the room after breakfast, I made my bed, I straightened the room, I dusted, I did whatever seemed to be necessary. And when I finished my work, I turned to my violin practice. That system prevented me from accomplishing what I should do on the violin. So I reversed things. I deliberately neglected everything else until my practice period was complete. And that program of planned neglect is the secret of my success. Why Daniel prayed three times a day isn't stated. Only that it was his practice to do so. It's been suggested that perhaps praying three times a day corresponded to the three sacrifices that were, uh, that were accomplished during in the temple. Another tradition says that the three prayer times lined up with the, the, the three patriarchs of the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the morning prayer with Abraham, the afternoon prayer with Isaac, and the evening prayer with Jacob. I don't know why Daniel prayed three times a day, but the important thing is that he had a regular, consistent, daily pattern of prayer. And I can imagine someone at this point say, Pastor, you are making prayer some kind of legalistic duty to fulfill. Instead of having set times to pray, shouldn't we live with an attitude of prayer, free to pray whenever and wherever we want? Isn't that what Paul was getting at when he said pray without ceasing? I don't need to be locked into a habit or a pattern of prayer. I can come into the presence of God whenever I need to. Okay. Have you? Today? I agree that we should have an attitude of prayer. But have you prayed? Today? How often during this last week did you spend time in prayer? I'm not trying at all to be adversarial or judgmental. But the reality is sometimes we're often like a t-shirt that I just recently purchased, which says, if I said I fix it, I will. There's no need to remind me every six months. <laughs> we talk about prayer. We talk about it. We just don't do it. Daniel had a specific place to pray, a specific time to pray, and he had a specific method. Now the Bible makes this comment that he prayed facing Jerusalem and he prayed kneeling on his knees. And I do not want to read into this description more than is there, but taken together provides an example or an illustration of a method of prayer, perhaps even a strategy of prayer. There's a proverb that says, if we aim at nothing, we are bound to hit it. Perhaps here is the most important component to get us off the log, to move us from the desire of participation to the actual praying. Many of you have probably seen the 2015, 2015 movie, The War Room. And if you've not seen it, I would encourage you to, to uh, watch it. Uh, it, it surrounds uh, a drug salesman, Tony Jordan, and his real estate wife, Elizabeth, uh, who, though they're outwardly successful, uh, have a large house, plenty of money, a beautiful daughter named Danielle, but behind the facade, Tony and Elizabeth's relationship is strained. Tony is callous, verbally abusive, thinking about cheating on Elizabeth, and in addition, his job requires frequent travel, and he's almost never there for his daughter. Elizabeth goes uh, to uh, visit the home of an elderly woman, Miss Clara, who is interested in selling her house. And Miss Clara senses the stress that Elizabeth is under and suggests that she fight for her marriage by praying for Tony. 
And so Miss Clara takes Elizabeth to a special closet that she's dedicated to praying. And she says, this is where I do my fighting. And as the camera zooms in, uh, the walls of this closet are covered with pages and pages and pages of prayer requests. Observing them, Elizabeth asks, so you wrote prayer for each area of your life? And Miss Clara responds, a prayer strategy. Yes. Now there's a lot more conversation that, and relationship that happened between Elizabeth and Miss Clara, who teaches Elizabeth to create her own war room. But what is powerfully clear is that from the walls of prayer requests plastered all over this closet is that Miss Clara had a strategy. Daniel had a strategy. I would argue that you and I need a strategy. So how do we develop one? Just a couple of suggestions. I would begin by making a list of people for whom you want to pray. And if you're looking for people to include your list, you might consider taking the church directory and begin praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pastor Jim and I would love it if our name is on your prayer list. If the list is too long to pray for everyone at one time, then divide it up into sections. There may be some requests that you want to make every day. And so maybe there are certain prayers every day you're going to pray for, maybe for yourself or for your family. But the rest of your list you might want to divide up by weeks or perhaps even by a month. You might decide on one day as you're praying that there's going to be a day where you specifically pray for the salvation of people who need to know Jesus and those that say they know him but aren't walking with him. Perhaps there's another day where you specifically pray for missionaries and ministries. Another day where you pray for your church and its leaders, including your pastors and your deacons and your teachers and your ministry leaders. The Bible says that we are to pray for those who have authority over us. So maybe there's another day where you decide to pray for all of those who have authority over us. Another suggestion would be to create a prayer journal where not only can you keep a list of prayer needs, but you might want to have a place where you can write down when prayer was answered. It might also be something in which you might decide to actually write out some prayers to the Lord. Because written prayers are not only an expression of our hearts at any point in life, but can be a reminder of God's faithfulness. I think I've shared this with you before, that, that once I was getting ready to have a devotion time and I picked up the Bible that I normally didn't use, and when I opened it, a half sheet of paper fell out. At this particular time in my life, I was pretty discouraged, kind of frustrated, and this half piece of paper turned out to be a prayer that I had written to the Lord. And I read this prayer, and I was thanking the Lord for what a joy it was to be the pastor of this church, for how great he was, how faithful he was. And I'm reading through this prayer, going, when in the world did I write this? And I looked up at the date, and it had been like six weeks earlier. I mean, we, we can forget so quickly. The third thing is to use Scripture as a part of your prayer life. There are several prayers in Scripture that we could use as we pray. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the prayer of Jesus that he taught his disciples. And that might be a prayer that we decide we're going to pray regularly or even daily. But consider praying biblical prayers personally for others. For example, listen to this prayer that Paul prayed for believers in Ephesus in chapter 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth delivers its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in an inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So what if we took that prayer, we kind of put it in our own words a little bit, and we applied it to our church and fellowship. Then I might pray, Lord, I pray that according to the riches of your glory, our church family will be strengthened with power through your spirit in the inner man, 
so that Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith and that we being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge so that we may all be filled with the fullness of God. Not only are there prayers in Scripture, but we can pray the Scriptures. In his book, Praying the Bible, Donald Whitney proposes using Scripture to pray to God, and he says basically what you're doing is taking words that originated in the heart and the mind of God, circulating back through your heart and mind back to God. By this, uh, his words become wings of your prayer. And so, for example... He illustrates this by taking the first verse of Psalm 23. You read the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. And you say something like this. Lord, I thank you that you are my shepherd. You're a good shepherd. You have shepherded me all of my life. And great shepherd, please shepherd my family today. Guard them from the ways of the world. Guide them into the ways of God. Lead them not into temptation. Deliver them from evil, O great shepherd. I pray for my children. Cause them to be your sheep. May they love you as the shepherd as I do. And Lord, please shepherd me in the decision that's before me about my future. Do I make that move or change or not? I also pray for the under shepherds at church. Please shepherd them as they shepherd us. And he says, and you continue praying anything else that comes to your mind when you consider the words, the Lord is my shepherd. And when nothing else comes to mind, you go to the next line. I shall not want. One of the premises of his book is that the reason that we struggle to pray is because it's boring. And when we learn how to take God's word and pray back to himself, we'll find that we're not just praying for the same things over and over and over and over and over again. Now when the edict came not to pray, except to Darius, Daniel didn't panic He didn't run home and wonder what he should do. Instead, ignoring the decree, he did what he had always done. He prayed. Daniel was a man devoted to God, and the practice of prayer alone did not generate devotion, but it was the expression of his devotion. Still, the connection between his character and his prayer life is hard to separate. Daniel was a man of faith, but could it also be that the practice of prayer contributed to that faith? Someone quipped, seven days without prayer makes one weak. Such was not the case with Daniel. Daniel was willing to die rather than to give up his right to pray to God. And then in verse 11, it says that these men came by agreement. Now listen, And they found Daniel making petition and supplication for his God. I find it interesting that the satraps and the commissioners knew where to find Daniel. And when they found him, they caught him in the act of praying to God. The irony is that when they brought him to Darius, they still could find no flaw in his character of which they did confuse him or any inconsistency in his faith. Verse 12, then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? And the king replied, The statement is true. According to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked, then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but he keeps making his petition three times a day. You know what? Daniel was guilty. Guilty of what? Guilty of praying. And you know the rest of the story. You know that Daniel's thrown into the lions of den and he's protected from harm by the power of God. Uh, Darius was was so excited when Daniel was safe. Uh, Didn't go well for these other guys. But Daniel prayed. He had a place of prayer. He had a time of prayer. He had a method of prayer. So I'm going to close this morning with a quote from Charles Finney. He says, We have had instruction until we are hardened. It is now time for us to pray.
Let's pray together.